Welcome everyone to the Foreign Press Center virtual briefing. My name is Ginny Staub and I'm the moderator for today's briefing. It is my pleasure to introduce Mallory Stewart, the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Arms Control, Deterrence and Stability. Today, Assistant Secretary Stewart will outline U.S. efforts to advance nuclear arms control and risk reduction measures with a particular connection to how these efforts intersect with the regional security environment. Just a reminder that the briefing today is on the record and we will post a transcript and a video of the briefing on our website, fpc.state.gov later today. If you've not already done so, please take a moment now to rename yourself in the chat window with your name, outlet, and country. And I would like to invite Assistant Secretary Stewart to begin with her opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, for that introduction. And thank you so much for all the, um, the press that have joined us today. Really, really happy to have this opportunity to speak with you um, and hopefully have an opportunity to answer questions as well. Um, I am, am very happy to be able to discuss what we've been doing um, in the arena of arms control, deterrence, and stability. And, and maybe I should just start with that name of the Bureau in case any of you are not familiar with our Bureau. It used to be the Arms Control Verification and Compliance Bureau. And of course, we still do verification and compliance, but we see that as crucial parts of our arms control efforts. The, the, the addition of deterrence to our title is because of all of the work we do in the arms control context to try to deter um, bad actions, to deter um, non-compliance with arms control, to sort of um, incentivize compliance with international law and norms and all of the architectures that the international community has set up uh, for greater security and stability in the global arena. So um, I can talk about uh, that uh, further and maybe an example I can provide is the work we've been doing um, to, to work towards normative developments of, of, of um, collective efforts towards responsible behavior on emerging tech, um, towards responsible behavior in the outer space arena. Um, with respect to emerging tech, we, we've been working very closely with our Department of Defense colleagues to bring on um, more governments and, 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 um, and regions to our political de declaration on the responsible use of AI and autonomy in the military, which right now has uh, 54 governments um, that have signed on. And it really entails um, some very fundamental um, commitments to try to help understand, appreciate, appreciate and get ahead of the risks that AI can bring into the military, not just with respect to the weapon systems that the military uses, but also with respect to the broader military context, such as um, understanding inherent human biases can impact decision making in the military human resources division or um, in promotion capacities, understanding how you can utilize AI in a manner ensuring its consistency with international law, which is relevant across the board um, to all of the military's use of AI. Um, and it's really a conversation that we uh, officially uh, kicked off last February um, it, with um, Undersecretary Jenkins uh, announcing our commitment to, um, to addressing responsible use um, of AI in the military arena. And we've actually evolved and, and, and heard from many countries um, as to their comfort level with this concept and what they would like to see in the political declaration. And we see it as very much a, a very live document growing and changing. Um, I can deep dive into that if there's any interest. Um, in the space arena, we're working towards ensuring um, that there is risk reduction for the challenges we deal with in the space domain. Um, so for example, space debris created by um, intentional um, anti-satellite testing is something that we've addressed uh, starting um, through uh, a U.S. commitment unilaterally made by Vice President Harris in April of 2022 um, and then put forward in the UN General Assembly context, uh, culminating in a, in a resolution um, in the first committee confirmed in the General Assembly of over 150 countries agreeing that direct ascent Earth to space uh, launched destructive, meaning debris creating anti-satellite tests should be prohibited and we should seek to prevent the creation of debris through that capacity going forward. Um, these are just two examples of, of what we've been working on in the risk reduction arena, responsible behavior arena, working to hear from other governments, incorporate a, a, a very broad based approach to how we can collectively define what the international community feels is responsible behavior so we can try to prevent and deter 
um, destabilizing or irresponsible behaviors in some of these arenas. Again, not not taking a position that the U.S. knows what the right approach is, but really working with the international community to figure out what could be addressed to minimize some of the threats that we experience in those arenas. Um, so I kind of went deep there and and, and went uh, pretty technical quick, but I should say our Bureau is, of course, working across the board on um, preventing weapons of mass destruction, um, uh, you know, in, in, in conformity with international law, trying to um, up uphold, enforce, and, and, and implement and verify the international legal agreements and commitments that countries have made in this context. And we recently rolled out our annual um, compli- arms control and non-proliferation compliance report to really share and be transparent with respect to the underlying information that we have and we rely upon to make some of our um, decisions and, and to raise some of our concerns with respect to compliance with these uh, treaties and commitments. Um, we work um, very closely uh, with our regional partners to understand where we can um, take steps through crisis communication, through um, awareness raising, um, through um, uh, uh, coordination um, and and uh, sort of um, capacity building towards risk reduction efforts of um, of. Uh, transparency, communicating concerns, communicating um, some of the drivers of instability in the regional context. So on that note, I will just highlight um, coming back from uh, New York, um, where I was on Monday and Tuesday. On Monday, hosting uh, 27 countries from the Western Hemisphere, um, including Canada um, and, um, and, and countries all up and down to discuss the value of nuclear risk reduction in particular, the value of trying to take steps to understand from the U.S. perspective, we see very broad-based nuclear risk reduction as something that can go hand in hand with our um, nuclear non-proliferation treaty requirements under the NPT to work towards disarmament. We do not see risk reduction, nuclear risk reduction as a substitute for um, the the um, N5, the, the P5, the permanent member of the um, Security Council, but also the nuclear weapon states under the NPT's obligation to work towards disarmament. But we see risk reduction as consistent uh, with that requirement and that obligation. And so we've been working to understand how we can we can um, build uh, awareness, but also hear from the Western Hemisphere countries, their approach to risk reduction and what they see as valuable in that context is specifically nuclear risk reduction, how we can um, work through transparency mechanisms, through um, uh, communication channels, through uh, exercises and um, and tabletops to really understand how they perceive uh, the risk reduction benefits of, of um, you know, how we work towards uh, nuclear disarmament verification, as we do through our international partnership for nuclear disarmament verification, the IPNDV, how we work toward creating um, an environment of, of of more stable and less insecure um, military context so that, you know, this is through our creating a, um, an environment for nuclear disarmament, our CEND initiative, um, we can bring together a lot of different voices um, as we do in the IPNDV. So both nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, um, uh, um, nuclear possessing states that n- are not party to the NPT, um, bring them together to hear their um, concerns and approaches to the numerous challenges we, sp- we face in the, in the um, nuclear arena, but also instability and drivers of arms races or drivers of concern in, in other arenas as well, including emerging technologies. Um, so we had a really good conversation on Monday explaining uh, how we approach risk reduction as productive and and um, and and part of the important approach that we need to take towards our NPT obligations, but also towards a more stable and secure environment. And then on Tuesday, we had a really good uh, trilateral meeting with Canada and with Mexico to, again, um, get a greater appreciation for um, all of the ways um, our three countries can work to support the NPT community, can work to support um, the international security environment, and to hear the concerns um, that that both Canada and Mexico had with what is perceived as a diminishing um, security environment right now, as the um, the P5 aren't able 
to um, uh, agree upon uh, crisis communication um, uh, provisions. We're not necessarily able to move forward toward greater risk reduction in that P5 context and really to hear um, from Mexico and Canada how we can more effectively uh, work towards um, a, a more cohesive P5 to work towards our Article 6 obligations under the NPT. Um, so again, I, I'm sorry, I'm switching back and forth between way too technical and high level context, but I'm trying to give um, some sense uh, of, of what we're doing in this bureau to work towards these efforts. And I will I could probably talk too much, but I do think question and answer is probably more helpful. I will conclude with we are working across every um, every um, arena of weapons of mass destruction, trying to strengthen the Chemical Weapons Convention um, and work toward universalizing its implementation, trying to strengthen um, the, the, the Biological Weapons Convention, working very closely uh, with Ambassador Ken Ward, uh, working to um, understand how we can move towards um, greater implementation and appreciation of verification possibilities, um, working in, of course, the nuclear nonproliferation treaty arena um, to, to bring more um, consensus and more forward um, push towards how we have successful progress on these issues. Um, and then, of course, um, in the conventional arms control context, trying to build up greater crisis communications, build up awareness of how transparency and and um, and, and uh, pre-notification of exercises can be to the benefit of stabilizing what could be challenging um, environments, really building on what our uh, Vienna document um, commitments can, can provide if there's anything they can do to help other destabilized regional um, uh, conflicts that have uh, conventional arms as a, as a big driver of instability. Um, uh, I will say uh, in the space arena right now happening this week and last week, um, we've been uh, working with our um, our Japanese colleagues uh, to propose jointly a UN Security Council resolution regarding the peaceful use of outer space. Um, you know, we, we feel this resolution is really important to reaffirm one of the core obligations of the Outer Space Treaty that countries must not put into orbit uh, nuclear weapons or other um, weapons of mass destruction. Um, and so specifically citing um, our, our effort to reconfirm at the UN Security Council level, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, um, including that obligation, um, but also hoping uh, while reaffirming this existing obligation um, that we can sort of also prohibit developing nuclear weapons or, or WMD for placement um, around Earth's orbit or on celestial bodies as, as would be inconsistent with the Outer Space Treaty. So I can talk to that um, more as well. Um, we think the resolution is straightforward and it's a really classic example of, of trying to um, reduce risks of, of misunderstanding and misperception by um, reaffirming, recommitting to, and really understanding how we can strengthen existing international law that the vast majority of the international community agrees with and worked on to create. Um, all right, so I probably talked too much. I've given a lot of substance for folks to ask about, but if you don't have any questions, I can keep talking, but I'll stop there because I see there's some there's some questions in the chat. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Madam Assistant Secretary. If you do have a question, please raise your hand and wait to be called upon. And then once called upon, please state your name and media outlet prior to asking your question. Let me... Um, ask one that has was pre-provided. So what nuclear risks do you see today in Latin America? Uh, what impacts those risks, risks and do you see them increasing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point because when we talk about reducing nuclear risks, we're not necessarily saying that um, Latin America, which is an especially positive um, element of, of, of nuclear risk reduction in their Tlata Loco treaty commitments and through their work with OpenAll, the implementing um, force and really uh, excellent organization that combines the Latin American community to support their Tlata Loco treaty. We're not saying that they themselves are at risk of developing nuclear weapons necessarily, but of course the nuclear risks that they experience are because everyone has a heightened uh, a risk of nuclear conflict while we have an unstable um, international arena, especially um, as we 
we have challenges with our ability to communicate and clearly prevent misunderstanding, miscalculation, or even uh, escalation with Russia specifically in this context. So the nuclear risks that we were discussing with the Latin American community really entail um, their concerns about um, escalation that is um, that could lead to nuclear conflict. And so how we um, embody an ability to, um, to, to limit uh, the development of nuclear arsenals, right? We talked about um, the fissile material issue, how we can work to reduce or how we can work to understand how we reduce the the, the development of fissile materials for nuclear weapons. Um, we talked about their concerns um, about escalation because of miscommunication and how we can work to get uh, crisis communication channels in place um, in the P5. And now of course, we need to do that with the agreement of the rest of the of the P5 um, or the N5, as 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 we we call them as well, um, the nuclear weapon states that are recognized under the NPT. How we can work towards crisis communications? How we can work towards um, encouraging uh, Russia to come back to the table on our new start negotiations? Um, how we can work towards risk reduction communications with China um, and 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 learning and addressing misunderstandings um, with the rest of the um, P5, but especially Russia and China. So the, the, the risk reduction that we talked about with, um, with the Western Hemisphere countries really involves their questions about nuclear disarmament, their questions about participating in some of the risk reduction mechanisms um, that we've been trying to support across the board, showing that, you know, again, as I mentioned, the IPNDV and the CEND, um, but also, you know, showing that those support risk reduction and are not um, somehow inconsistent with the obligation to work towards disarmament, um, showing how participating in a lot of our emerging technology commitments uh, would help reduce risk, right? If you can prevent the unintentional risk added into a strategic system through AI, and you can prevent unintentional risk added into just a, a, um, a military context in general that could be added by AI, that's taking a step towards uh, reducing conflict, misunderstanding, and miscalculation. So all of these issues are very much swirling around in our in our expansive conversation all day on Monday, um, and also more specifically focused on with Canada and Mexico on Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is: um, So many countries in the in the in Latin America have. Um, tenuous security environments such as Venezuela, how does that affect its view of nuclear risks in the neighborhood? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the risk of um, uh, proliferation is, is something that's real for all countries, um, but also the risk of being caught up in a, um, a nuclear conflict, even if countries don't have nuclear weapons, is also something that we've seen uh, as a result come up in conversations and, and come up in concerns as a result of um, uh, the the illegal and continuing invasion of Ukraine. I think, you know, all of us being aware of the interconnectedness of, of our societies because of the broad effect and and really tragic and 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 um, and extraordinary consequences of any use of of nuclear weapons. I think ties us all together in this context. So, in a difficult security environment. Um, of, of any country, but for example, the question is about Venezuela, where you have conflict that could escalate. Um, you know, the concern has to be either preventing a broader, uh, wide scale um, uh, conflict um, from pursuing from a regional conflict, but also preventing um, the use of more and more dangerous weapons to continue the escalation and confrontation. So in the in the in the Venezuelan context, and I you know would obviously def defer to the experts on on this call, but also the regional experts, having the ability to prevent unintentional escalation, miscommunication and miscalculation and limit the the drivers um, toward global escalation in any context. So having communication channels, having uh, transparency, um, having ability to cut through disinformation is something that uh, we we talked about um, in in our in our uh, nuclear risk reduction conversations because it is all very related, um, especially in this environment again of disinformation. So um, we don't want to have a situation where misunderstanding miscalculation leads to increasing participation, increasingly escal escalatory weapons involvement, and then other countries bringing in whatever weapon systems they have to address the conflict. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what can be done to further bring global views together on nuclear risks? 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a really good question because we've historically had such strong divides between um, some of the non-nuclear weapon states, between nuclear weapon states, between uh, nuclear umbrella states, those states that feel they rely on nuclear weapon states to confirm their security. And I think um, what we've been slowly sort of realizing is that at, at the heart of it, we all agree that the world would be safer and more secure without the presence of nuclear weapons. But we find ourselves in this world where nuclear weapons exists and there's no good, easy answers to um, pure disarmament. And I think hearing on Monday all of the advocates for sort of a nuclear ban treaty was was really good to hear, but to try to explain the challenges um, from the nuclear we weapon states perspectives where if you feel that you are either protecting um, other countries that have made the decision not to develop any more or any um, any nuclear weapons of their own, and you feel you have an obligation to protect them in some of these countries, and the U.S. government itself sometimes feels that we are placed in the crosshairs of other nuclear weapon states, how just a pure unilateral disarmament is even possible in that arena. So really hearing and explaining and diving in to the difference of perspective and the difference of perception and how, um, you know, a very good point was made that for many countries, nuclear risk reduction would be accomplished completely if you just got rid of nuclear weapons. Like, I understand there's certain there's a certain um, truth to that statement. It's just the reality of how we get to that disarmament point is what we need to work towards, how we need to diminish instability, maximize security through conformity with international law. International architecture is way too... Um, uh, you know, remain convinced that countries won't seek to violate uh, the UN Charter or the existing constructs that prevent and try to um, uh, forestall additional wars. So how we build those architectures, how we build that confidence and security is what we need to all work together on, regardless of nuclear weapons status. And that's that's really where I think we were able to come together, that risk reduction is, 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 is really comprehensive across the board, something that we can agree to, while we agree that the nuclear weapon states have an obligation under the NPT um, to work towards disarmament. And we all need to sort of remind ourselves of that obligation as well, and yet come to the table to diminish the drivers of instability and, and unintentional or intentional escalation, diminish those drivers. So prevent that misunderstanding, miscalculation, and that um, disregard for international law. So Again, I, I'm trying to kind of go back and forth between the 20,000 foot level and the and the more specifics, but um, but I do think that's something that we can all come together on, and that there really is a good amount of consensus that in a perfect world there would be no nuclear weapons, but we're not in that perfect world. So what we need to work together toward is how we get to that place, and how we get there practically, realistically, and without allowing a further exacerbation of either nuclear proliferation or uh, nuclear weapons programs. Thank you. So I think you just answered um, the last question that we had there, which was, um, how does risk reduction, is the goal risk reduction or disarmament and how do they sort of interrelate? Absolutely. I think the ultimate goal for all of us is and should be disarmament. That's our obligation. But risk reduction is synergistic and they can work together at the same time because we can't wait for disarmament to, to start working on risk reduction, right? We can't say we must disarm now and not worry about anything else. We have to reduce the risks that we're driving towards armed races, reduce those risks so that we can actually talk comprehensively about bringing Russia to the table, bringing the P5 as a whole to the table to, to fulfill and figure out how we can more fulsomely address our obligations for disarmament. So um, they are not inconsistent and we cannot work um, towards one while ignoring the other, right? And I don't think... Um, I don't think it's 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 very helpful to say risk reduction can't solve the problem, right? Because um, nuclear weapons ultimately exist. I don't think that means you have to just discard risk reduction uh, as a whole. I think you have to work to reduce the drivers of instability and insecurity and reduce the drivers of escalation toward potential nuclear war, which the P5 has agreed <laughs> um, can never be won and so must never be fought. And yet making that real, making that understanding and appreciation and trying to get away from, you know, the risks that we've seen and the and the saber rattling that we've we've heard in the in the Ukraine context more and more. Um, so so those are those are consistent efforts, but one is not to the preclusion of the other for sure. Thank you. Any final questions from our journalists? 
So this ends the Q&A portion of today's briefing. Assistant Secretary Stewart, do you have any final remarks you'd like to share, please? Um, just that I encourage all of you to reach out, uh, reach out um, to the Bureau and ask as many questions as you can. I think it's a um, foregone or maybe a cliche that the Arms Control Bureau is all about transparency. The more we can raise awareness of what we're working towards and, and really utilize your good voices in the international community to, to ask the questions, to, to, to make the points, to sort of highlight that that arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament, all of these are objectives that we all should be working towards and they are all an inherent part of the security dynamic that we need to work you know, to achieve global stability and security. So um, appreciate your interest in this conversation. Thank you for letting me talk too much and, uh, and, and please do come back with more questions. Thank you. We do have one final question. Okay. Christoph Rivera, please, of Sputnik. You can turn on okay, your camera, great. please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, so this is a quick question. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Iran develop, getting close to developing nuclear weapons. And I just want to see if you have any update on what the U.S. might be doing to address that concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we work, we're we working very closely with the IAEA and with the, um, the Board of Governors in that context to try to encourage um, greater transparency, greater willingness to work together uh, with the international organizations set up really to confirm no diversion of nuclear, um, uh, you know, capabilities toward a weaponized program. And I think we have to work with the international community, and that's that's the step that we're supporting. Um, this isn't something that our bureau directly leads on, so I'm I'm kind of recounting what we're working on in other contexts of the State Department um, and the White House. But we certainly support all of the efforts of the IEA to gain greater insight, um, to address the insecurity and really the questions and the misunderstanding that results from a lack of transparency. So it's consistent with all of the risk reduction um, that the efforts that we're doing across the board is that greater transparency can, can answer the questions and prevent um, some of the misunderstandings, miscalculations, or potential um, sort of uh, concerns that stem from not being able to answer questions about diversion, answer questions about the development of a program that's incredibly destabilizing to the region and could lead to greater proliferation. Thank you so much. So this concludes our briefing. I want to give a very special thanks to our briefer for sharing their time with us today and to those of you who participated. Thank you. Have a great Thank afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you so much.